Good afternoon. This is Becky's Calls. And our guests today are Michael Quinn Patton, Sharon Benjamin, and if Moira uh, West Mears joins us. Also, we are fortunate to have Francis Wesley with us. Michael Quinn Patton is an independent organizational development and evaluation consultant and a scholar of evaluation, and he's president of the American Evaluation Association and the author of numerous books and scholarly articles on evaluation. Sharon Benjamin is, um, he calls herself a pracademic um, who consults with many government, NGO, uh, private and government public healthcare organizations. Um, she's taught executive leadership courses for NPA students at NYU and the University of Pennsylvania. And is Moira with us yet? Hi. <laughs> Hi, yeah, this is Mariah. Oh, Mariah, thank you so much for being here. Um, Mariah West Mears is, has worked as an evaluator and evaluation capacity development expert in international development for more than 18 years. She's a senior evaluator at the World Bank's Independent Evaluation Group and the author of scholarly works on evaluation. And we also have Francis Wesley, who is, um, among other things, the co-author of a fabulous book that was co-written by Michael Quinn Patton and the late Brenda Zimmerman called Getting to Maybe. And there's a link for the book on our chat box. Um, so Sharon, if you want to open up our conversation. Oh, thank you. This is a thrill. Michael, congratulations on the new book. It's really fabulous. Um, as I was reading it, I started to wonder, and you address it in the middle of the book, about where evaluation has progressed and where we think we've become fairly good and successful, where we still have room to grow and improve, and places where maybe we're not quite there yet. Um, so I'm wondering how you think principle-focused evaluation helps the evolution of evaluation as a field. Well, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Plexus, and everyone for this opportunity to um, dialogue about the new book. We say that evaluation grew up in the projects. Um, it has a project mentality. Um, and projects are basically closed systems. Um, smart goals and logic models treat um, programs um, the illusion that we have control over what happens and can can determine uh, that if we do certain things, certain outcomes will result. So projects really take place in simple space for the most part. Um, and that mentality, which is what most of the methods have been designed to deal with, that approach, that defining the situation, has given rise to um, a great deal of knowledge and ways of going about evaluating projects and programs and that's what evaluation um, has grown to do well. What it doesn't do well is deal with initiatives that are taking place uh, in complex dynamic systems, innovative initiatives, um, things that you know, are emerging um, and what, what evaluators tend to do is to try and force those things into the project mode and that typically stifles innovation and doesn't um, uh, provide the kind of information that's really needed to operate in complex dynamic systems. So going back to the time that I started working with, with Frances Wesley um, on innovation, and she was at the time running the McGill-McConnell Leadership Program for national leaders across Canada, and that led to getting to maybe book. Um, and we looked at social movements and, and major uh, examples of change and what we found was that um, these great social movements like Mothers Against Drunk Driving and Mohammed Yunus's work on microfinance, Yuli Seal's work on saving species um, were not based on detailed plans and logic models and and predetermined indicators they were based on a, a strong belief that the way things were could not continue um, that things needed to change and that they set out to make those changes out of a sense of calling and vision, um, uh, typically grounded in a set of principles and values. Um, and so that's what we found anchored people in facing complex dynamic systems. And so 
in as as evaluation if evaluation is going to serve um, people dealing with complexity we're going to have to do it with, with ways of conceptualizing that work that doesn't push it into the project and program mold um, and that's where the principles come in is actually treating principles as something that can be evaluated um, basically around three questions uh, are the principles actually meaningful to the people who are um, presumably being guided by them? Are they being adhered to? And if they're being adhered to, where are they taking people? Um, and that, uh, that frame allows us to treat principles as the thing to be evaluated, rather than forcing that into a project or program mold. That's, that's really helpful. Can you give an example about how principles guide Um, so let's let's take um, an example from since Francis is on the call and worked closely with Yuli Seal um, when he began trying to work to to save endangered species and to save uh, the um, um, DNA of, of endangered species um, he realized that there were going to be a large number of different players with different stakes, researchers and zookeepers and people who were running conservation areas and politicians and, and, and people dedicated to conservation. And so um, uh, from the very beginning, their guiding principle was to collaborate across these various responsibilities and lines of division. A collaboration, the commitment to collaborate is a not uncommon principle, um, but it's one that's very difficult to actually follow um, because of power dynamics and um, because of the, the divisions and territoriality. Um, I was at a conference of um, youth on, on youth work um, a while back for three days and at the end people were sharing their takeaways and it was researchers and advocates and parents and youth themselves and one of the mothers who was an advocate um, who was deeply involved with collaborative efforts, and this was a conference about collaboration, said she had come to realize that collaboration is a lot like teenage sex. She said this very straight. It was clearly an insight that she took seriously. Collaboration is a lot like teenage sex. Everybody talks about it all the time. Everybody thinks that everybody else is doing it. Those who are doing it aren't doing it very well. Despite that, they all talk about how wonderful it is. Um, and so when, when you have collaboration as a principle, um, finding out in what that means to people, finding out what's actually happening with it, and what it's resulting in um, becomes part of a principles-focused evaluation. And Francis, as a very skilled facilitator, um, ended up playing a critical role with Yuli in trying to facilitate these very diverse perspectives um, and uh, to help everyone realize another principle that guided that work um, not on our watch um, yeah. that they were going to do everything they could during the short time that they had to uh, save what they could so those kinds of principles help bring people together um, and evaluating them helps make them real not just something to put on a wall after a retreat but to actually determine that the work is, is being guided by those principles in, in a meaningful way. And collaboration is a good example of that. It's actually quite evaluable and that evaluation helps people do a better job of it. Can, can you talk about the difference between a principle, a guideline, and a rule? Uh, I'd love to. Um, so one of, the, one, one of the things in the book is a framework for what constitutes an effectiveness principle. I distinguish effectiveness principles from moral principles and, and, and natural principles, um, a la um, how the world works physically, uh, Newton's principles. So an effectiveness principle, I've identified five criteria for what constitutes um, a meaningful um, principle for evaluation purposes. Um, and that means that it does provide guidance. 
um, that it, the guidance is useful, it actually helps you make decisions, that it, it's inspirational, that it's developmental, um, that is can be adapted to different situations, and it can be evaluated. So that falls into the acronym of GUIDE, um, G-U-I-D-E, those five characteristics. Um, so a difference between a principle and a rule is that the only thing to evaluate around rules is whether they're followed. Rules are absolute. You do them or you don't do them. So a rule is you come to a stop sign, you're supposed to come to a full and complete stop, not a rolling stop. A stop sign is a rule. Defensive driving is a principle. It doesn't tell you precisely what to do, but it basically says pay attention, um, adapt your, your driving to the weather conditions, to other drivers, to what the situation here is, be situationally aware. Um, we've in, actually just had a really interesting example of a, of a change from a rule to a principle. In 1999, the American Association of Pediatrics um, formulated a rule, no screens under age two. Um, this is before all of our current devices. This was when we just had computer screens and TV screens in 1999. Um, but basically, they, they said infants, children under the age of two should not be exposed to any television, should not be exposed to any computers, much less iPads, uh, iPhones, and everything else. I mean, I really see, recently saw a mobile for a crib that had six iPhones circling around an infant. Um, so the, um, in, in December of 2016, they revised that guidance. The American Academy of Pediatrics changed that from the rule, no screens under two, to no screens under two without interaction. That makes it a principle, not a rule. No screens under two without interaction means that the screens were not the problem. It was using the screens as babysitters that was the problem. And given the ubiquity of screens, their guidance then is to interact with children. Now clearly you're going to interact with a six-month-old different than an 18-month-old. Uh, if there are multiple children present, what adults are present, what's on the screen. And so that becomes a principle where they're basically saying don't just use the screen as a passive device. Make it an interactive engagement experience and that moves it from a rule to a principle. In those guide criteria that I just laid out and part of what I advocate doing to, to move from a value statement to a principle is you need an active imperative verb. Principles take the form of active imperative verb, do this. Um, it has an active verb. So um, what I thought I would do is actually use, if we had the opportunity, the Plexus Institute statement of what Plexus Institute stands for and illustrate to you how to convert statements into principles. Um, if you'd bring up that on the screen for people to see, this is the opening web page of the Plexus Institute. And you'll see it says, the future of Plexus has begun, and it lists three statements about what Plexus is. An open network for knowledge sharing, learning, and collaborating. A curated repository of digital content and models addressing complexity theory and practice. In connection to network projects, people, and ideas that engage practice and support applications rooted in complexity. Um, so to turn those into principles, we would need an active imperative verb at the beginning of each one of these. These are descriptive statements as they are written. They are purpose statements. We become a principle. We take the the um, uh, opening one, and this is part of what the facilitation of principles work involves. Would be deciding what verb you want to put at the beginning of that. Um, nurture an open network. Um, support an open network. Um, create and maintain an open network. Um, it becomes a principle when we have an active verb that makes it not just a descriptive statement, but an action statement. Um, the second one, a curated repository of digital content. Um, because of the importance of complexity, I probably work on reframing that to put complexity at the beginning, 
So we could take addressing, a gerund form, and make that the active verb, address complexity theory and practice um, uh, through a curated repository of digital content and models. That makes the emphasis on complexity theory and practice rather than on the repository, which is a means to the end. Um, and then the third statement is uh, be connected. Um, and uh, with a variety of different kind of things. Again, um, be connected through a common interest in complexity with others interested in complexity. So you take statements that are normative or descriptive or value statements and add an imperative verb to make them action oriented because principles are not just beliefs. Values are belief statements. Principles are behavior statements. They guide behavior. An effectiveness principle tells you what to do and you need an imperative verb to do that. So, Michael, building on that, one of the places in the book that I found most moving <clears throat> is uh, around page 125, for those of you who've got the book, uh, where you're talking about truth, beauty, and justice with regard to evaluations. And you, you quote Ernie House in his philosophy around evaluations have to be some things to be so, to have merit, to be worthy. And you go on and flip, uh, who is it, Jane Davidson's notions around um, truth, beauty, and justice and evaluation. Can you talk a little bit about that? So Ernie House went back to in the 70s, actually went back to Plato to look at the criteria for judging things, and that's where it came up with good beauty and justice, and began um, framing evaluation in, in those terms as values and in, as an evaluation criteria. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's an interesting and timely framing, I think, because um, the whole notion of truth is very much in play these days. Um, as you may have noticed, the, the, the Oxford dictionaries every year pick a word of the year as a new word that they're incorporating and notice people are using. And the 2016 word of the year was anti-truth, um, as in we live in an anti-truth era. Um, and so, the, with things like fake news and alternative facts, the, the very notion of whether or not truth exists or can exist in some meaningful way has been brought into doubt. Um, so when one reconnects from an evaluation perspective with truth, beauty, and, and justice, um, truth is in the nature of the evidence. Um, beauty is, in Ernie's terms, the coherence of the argument. Um, and justice is the way in which what we do affects the well-being of those in need. And taking that analysis and turning them into to principles then, it, um, for guiding evaluators, the principles become a seek truth, experience beauty, and work for justice. Those are pretty... Um those are pretty big worlds for some of us working in the trenches. I'm in the federal government right now, and I will say that there's not a ton of conversation about uh, any one of those words right this minute. But one of the things, one of the things that's been happening, uh, Sharon, as I've worked with this, um, is because evaluations become such a, a routine paperwork, administrative compliance function. I'm finding that what what excites people when they have a chance to talk about principles is that's actually what they care about. Um, and the reaction of working with, with people, uh, people in youth homelessness. I was just working with the USDA um, um, people and uh, did a workshop for fo folks in plant protection at USDA. And when we got away from the OMB requirements for evaluation and started talking about um, what did people care about? Why were they in plant protection? What mattered to them? And started talking about their personal principles and their organizational principles, despite our climate, they got very excited. Um, 
about what it means to protect the food supply for the American people um, and, and how much responsibility they felt in that. Um, so it, it, it can be, uh, and often uh, I find is, a way for people to tell their story through evaluation about the things that really matter to them. We, one of the examples in the book, as you know, is a set of youth um, programs working with youth homelessness, organizations working with homeless youth in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we spent a year and a half, through, uh, half a day a month for a year and a half with the six executive directors of those organizations. Not one of them missed one of those meetings. And they all said it was the most rewarding experience of their careers because we came together and talked about what brought them to this work, what they cared about, and what principles guided them. And in getting to maybe, that's what we found, created social movements. That's where people live. That's what they, and so for evaluation to be able to honor that, to, um, I, I say in the preface, principles-focused evaluation is for principles-based programs uh, uh, directed by principles-driven people. And um, principles-focused evaluation then connects with where people live as inspiration in that regard, um, even, um, in the federal government, when you can um, when you can create the space for those honest conversations and uh, and view in the adaptive cycle terms, this is a creative destruction period, um, uh, and uh, we will get on the other side of it. Yeah, M Mariah, you, you're in one of the largest evaluation shops in the world. How do these things show up for you? Um. Well, I was I was actually going to to ask uh, Michael for some some tips on this because the organization that well I work for the World Bank and I happen to work for the Independent Evaluation Group, which is the largest evaluation body within the World Bank Group. There are others, but we happen to be the biggest, and we're independent, so we function um, largely, um, you know, in an ex post project type of environment. So um, it's a lot of the things that I think. Uh, 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 Michael would, you know, sees uh, opportunity for some change. So, so my question to you, Michael, would be for a large organization like ours with established organizational structures, departmental mandates, uh, and working norms. What would what would be some of your approaches to taking on more of a? Well, the it's the the World Bank's an interesting uh, case, of course, and and one of the evaluations that's featured in the book is the, the 2005 Paris Declaration, which is not the climate change declaration, but in 2005, the, the world's um, countries and the international agencies, including the World Bank, came together to change the paradigm for how international aid is done. Um, and they developed five principles and adopted five principles. They're called the Paris Declaration Principles of, on International Development Aid. And the World Bank was a signatory to those. Um, and the, um, an independent evaluation was commissioned of those World Bank, uh, of those uh, uh, international development aid principles. Um, and they, the five principles really rep represented a huge paradigm shift for how international aid would be done if they were followed. So the first principle was country ownership of aid priorities. And one of the ways I talk about in the book that you know you have a principle is when you can identify its opposite or the contrary principle, so that you actually know that it's providing guidance. So the way that international aid has historically been done was not based upon recipient country uh, priorities, but based upon the national security interests of the donor countries. So to move from the principle of international aid serving donor country national interests to having international aid serve the priority uh, strategies of the recipient countries is a major change in principles. The Paris Declaration principles called for donors to align their aid with country priorities and for donors to harmonize their aid with each other. Um, and um, so the evaluation of those principles actually became the engine for implementation of the principles because there was no mechanism for implementation um, outside of the goodwill of the various players. And um, the, 
the World Bank, uh, ironically, uh, refused to participate in that evaluation, um, which was actually have examined the extent to which uh, bank aid was following the very principles they signed on to. I had a meeting with the, ID, the independent evaluation group um, at the World Bank where we had quite a, a intense interaction around that decision to not play with others in the international evaluation, the joint evaluation that was done. But it's a good example of, of, um, of principles work. Now the new work that that um, the independent evaluation group and Carolyn is leading the way on, and I think is a crack in the in um, where the light can get through. In Leonard Cohen's words, um, is with the new sustainability principles and the transformation principles. Carolyn Hyder has been one of the articulate spokespersons on the global stage uh, for principles of transformation and holding of uh, international players accountable for acting in ways that recognize our global uh, sustainability crisis and work to transform systems. And, and they've articulated five principles of transformation. Those are inspiring principles, they're high reaching principles. And um, I think if, if you actually move towards having every World Bank evaluation, um, make those principles part of the evaluation, not the traditional criteria of just efficiency and effectiveness, um, but principles of sustainability um, and of transformation. Um, that puts evaluation on a high road, uh, including the work of the World Bank. Um, I, I can't argue with that. Uh, I wasn't here for the Paris Declaration uh, activities, uh, but, but I'm somewhat familiar with, with how, that, how that played out. I wanted to ask you another question, um, and that would be then, um, you know, how do you how do you equip evaluators with the skills needed, or are the skills that we might think of traditional evaluators um, having are they enough? And if not, what should evaluators be adding uh, to their sort of portfolio of skills? Um, it's, it's a great question, and it's, it's one of the, the challenges of our times because a huge amount of resources are going in to building the capacity of national evaluation systems in relationship to the Sustainable Development Goals and um, um, the American Evaluation Association and the other um, associations, the European, the Australasian, um, uh, Canadian, are all involved in major capacity building efforts, virtually all of which are based upon the project mentality. Um, the, the, the basics of evaluation remain mired in that, that project thinking. When, when Francis ran the McGill-McConnell program and they were looking for evaluators, um, they, she couldn't find any evaluators who could work with them without predetermined indicators um, and a logic model. The, when in fact the whole point of the program was to have the participants deal with those issues and not predetermine them, was to have the participants figure out what a healthy nonprofit sector was, not to tell them in advance what it was. Um, and evaluators couldn't get their heads around that. So it involves working with complexity, with the principles of complexity and the concepts of complexity. And um, there are evaluators, a, a new generation of evaluators who are taking complexity seriously, um, and understanding that that is not additional project and program evaluation. It, uh, it involves um, high tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, it requires being able to accompany innovators on the journey of innovation, not just a pre and post kind of exercise, which misses all of the important action. Um, and, and so it is, it is substantial rethinking of the role of evaluators, um, and uh, including from being independent to being interdependent. The very notion of independence in complex dynamic systems is nonsensical. Um, and, and so um, the interdependence of all of us in this time of sustainability crisis means that, that uh, we're rethinking the evaluation principles. There is Currently, an AEA task force, American Evaluation Association task force, 
that's revising the guiding principles for evaluation, which um, were not stated in principles terms, and they're, so they are revising them to be stated in principles terms, but they're looking at adding two principles given the state of the world, this will come before the membership for a vote next year. One is that all evaluations should address sustainability and that all evaluations should address equity. So I know there, June just posted on the chat box a uh, question, what about reflections by participants about what's happening? What do we know about how reflection can be transformative? Does that ring any? The, 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 the very, it begins with the principle of providing opportunities for deep reflection. And then, um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges, I think, in a lot of the learning formats that I see and the conference formats that I see um, is, the, the shallowness of reflection and the voyeurism that is a part of reflection. I, I uh, did the closing um, section of a three-day uh, philanthropic conference on learning. And at the end, um, um, suggested that my experience was the conference was almost pornographic because people were voyeurs and uh, everybody was doing a little bit of showing of their stuff, uh, just enough to be titillating, but not enough for anybody to actually learn anything because it was not going deeply into, into anything. Um, I've done work um, um, with the case method. Um, we developed some teaching cases and um, have worked with foundations, um, including cases, examples in the book, um, but for example, I facilitate reflective practice with the Blandon Community, uh, the Blandon Foundation in Northern Minnesota. Their senior staff devoted a full day um, uh, a month for six months to reflecting on one part of their, their mission. And we got deeply into their, their principle of committed connections as a way of operating, being um, connected to their grantees and to communities. And after six full days working on that, they felt they now knew what the questions were um, that they needed to engage in and came up with a very exciting um, framework for understanding what, what they meant by committed connections. Um, that that then it becomes an example where principles focused evaluation helps take something like the principle of being reflective, off, offer opportunities for reflection, and examine what does that actually mean in practice? What are people taking away from it? Um, what are they doing with it? What, what changes does it make in their behaviors? And uh, helping use evaluation to deepen um, reflective practice. So there's some pretty lively um, back and forth in the chat box. One of the things that caught my eye is related to rigorous thinking. And further on in the book, you stop me in my tracks with a definition of rigorous thinking in which you say it, in, it combines critical thinking, creative thinking, evaluative thinking, inferential thinking, and practical thinking. Wow, that's a tall order for those of us who are mortal. How do, how, do you see, how do you see us being able to manage that level of demand? Um, so that's the first question. How do, how do we, how can we hone our skills to do that? And my second part is what about attribution error? So let's, let's start with that first, um, and I'll come back to the rigorous piece. Um, this is at the heart of what Plexus Institute represents. Um, attribution is a nonsensical concept in complex dynamic systems. You can't do it. It doesn't exist. It's not meaningful. Um, 
and it puts us down the, the wrong track. Attribution belongs in simple systems, um, in simple space. You can do attribution in simple space. But in complex dynamic systems, the very nature of what complexity means is it that there aren't linear, simple kind of attribution lines. The, the rigor section of the book really flows from um, understanding and the argument that I make in that and in the, the qualitative book, fourth edition, is that rigor, this widely used evaluation term, I basically argue that rigor does not reside in methods. Rigor resides in thinking. Methods don't do anything around rigor. Um, methods are ways of getting you a design and ways of gathering data, but the rigor resides in the the rigor with which you engage the work. It's rigorous thinking. That insight actually comes from the intelligence community. After the Iraq debacle um, and the way in which uh, intelligence was cherry-picked and politicized that led up to the Iraq invasion um, where there turned out not to be any weapons of mass destruction, the intelligence community was deeply demoralized and their leaders got together and did reflective practice around what went wrong, how did they get it so bad, um, and they were basically um, discredited. Nobody was going to take them seriously anymore. They spent considerable time and came up with what they called the rigor attribute model. You can Google that. I also describe it in the book. Um, but it's basically, they came up with eight principles of rigorous thinking that are, are standard methodological principles like triangulation, um, that um, and and being sure you've got multiple perspectives and that you interpreted things from uh, different points of view and that you you do serious devil's advocate work, um, um, you know it turned out that they were all using the one same key informant and not telling anybody who their key informant was. Um, his name was Curveball. Um, some called him Screwball, but in fact um, there was no triangulation. There was um, no multiple sources. There was no looking at alternative ways of thinking about things. There was no gathering of additional evidence. Um, no creative examination of what might go on. Um, and so um, the, the notion that, that this is rigor resides in deep thinking about what's going on and rigorous engagement with everything from the questions to the design to the interpretation of the application um, is the heart, I think, of dealing with evaluation in complex dynamic systems because it can't be formulaic, it can't be standardized, it can't be off-the-shelf models. Uh, it, there are no best practices. Um, what there is is deep engagement with the dynamics of complex systems. And all of those words, Sharon, of being creative and practical and, and, and critical thinking um, and inferential and deductive and abductive and retroductive, thinking, um, those are what my father would call common sense. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, labeling them and trying to list them and, and graphic them makes it difficult. It basically is a uh, emergent, bottoms up, collaborative, engaging, uh, co-creation process of figuring out what the hell is going on in complex dynamic systems, tracking it as best we can, making judgments about it, um, and um, uh, adapting in rapidly moving uh, systems. Rob Steiner posted um, just a few minutes ago that the notion of interdependence is key. And this, the nexus between individualism and our place in the network and he asks whether the stewardship excuse me the stewardship model is a is an adequate alternative do you have thoughts on that well the the the, the, the two different pieces there um, I think that both of them both stewardship and interdependence suggest that the key are relationships that it's, it's about relationships stewards are in relationship with the people who they're stewarding for and with. Um, the, the interdependence piece, I think, is, is 
is challenging to evaluate is to understand that we are part of the systems we evaluate. We're not outside of them. We affect them. Uh, we're affected by them. Um, and it, it's ironic that in the international community and in traditional academic evaluation, independence has been treated as fundamental to credibility when, in fact, in much of the world, especially the indigenous world, I've been fascinated by working with my indigenous colleagues, the Maori people in, in New Zealand, for example, for whom credibility entirely depends upon being known by them. Um, if, you, if you come in as a stranger from the outside, you have no credibility. You have to have sponsorship, you have to have champions, you have to, have, you have to become a known entity to them, which means being in relationship to them to have credibility. And, and so the only thing that independence gets you is distance. And the only thing that distance gets you is distance. Um, it doesn't mean that you, you know any, anything. So the example that I use with folks in establishing our, our interdependence and our stewardship is to, for evaluators, um, and, and Bob Stake, one of our pioneers, did a wonderful article in the American Journal of Evaluation about uh, what evaluators stand for. And the, the notion that we're supposed to be somehow neutral um, uh, about the issues of the day, he calls uh, very beautifully nonsense. Who wants an evaluator who hasn't made up their mind uh, about hunger? Is that a bad thing? Um, about rape, about community violence, about the degradation of the environment. Do we want people who, who are neutral about those issues? Um, so when I work, for example, with organizations working on AIDS, and I, I get collaborative, I get close to those folks, I try to help them do a good job, um, I try to build trust with them, but I tell them, my brother died from AIDS early in the epidemic. I care deeply about AIDS and people living with AIDS, and if you're screwing up and not doing a good job, I'm going to be all over you. I'm not giving you any breaks because I care about AIDS. I'm going to be harder on you than somebody who just came in and did a job. I'm going to kick your ass. You better be doing a good job because I care about this stuff. That's my interdependence. So Francis, I know you just got back from, uh, I think, an overnight flight. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm going to, I think. Uh, how, as you're listening to this conversation unfold, can you do a little weaving with your work? Yeah, I mean, I think the principle-based evaluation for me is a, is a real breakthrough when, in, when you're trying to work with social innovation. Uh, because, in fact, I think that in order for social innovation, you know, a new idea or invention to actually have a really broad or transformative impact, it has to be able to both scale out but also scale up and affect, you know, broader cultural, social institutions, et cetera. And, and key to that is, is for the innovators themselves to have a real sense of what is the, the kind of essence, the unchanging piece of whatever that innovation happens to be. And that's actually not trivial. It's quite hard for them to get hold of that. And um, you know what we, we found in Gabe and Baby, but also since then that there's a tendency to attach yourself to form. Once you've got you know, a formula or an invention, a product, a process, or that seems to be working, there, there is a temptation to begin to feel, well, that is the innovation. But once they come to feel that way, it actually is like death to the innovation because in order for the innovation to actually grow over time, sometimes very long time scales, um, it, it has to, in fact, uh, combine and recombine with, you know, what Stuart Kaufman called the adjacent possible. It has to make partnerships. It has to, and, and in the process of doing that, the innovation itself changes. Um, so the key question then becomes, What's essential? You know, what is the core that you can't let go of? Because you, in order to truly be transformative, you have to let go of a lot. And I, you know, once Michael got onto this principle-based evaluation, I suddenly realized, well, that's what it is. It's the principles. If they really hold the principles and keep them enshrined, there's multiple ways that the, the innovation itself can evolve and change in order to have a, a ripple effect, ever wider kinds of impacts on the broader system which created the problem in the first place. So, but when I sp speak to innovators and programs that I run, 
about what the principle is, you know, I realize that it's a, it's, it's a long process to get there. They don't just rhyme them off, you know. Uh, okay, these are my principles. It's like they're stopped and they go back on their heels and then they start to think, well, what, what is the essential thing? And, and, uh, and Michael, I'm all, I often think then, of, you know, the minimum specs, Brenda, Brenda's minimum specs, because you think, you, and you can't have thousands of these principles, so the thing becomes equally rigid. There's no, no room for movement. So trying to get at these, the absolute essential principles without which this thing would not be what it is, but with which evolution and, and transformation, both of the innovation and of the surrounding, uh, the surrounding context can happen. So I, I think it's, it's so fundamental to transformative social innovation that it's like, for me, it's a great breakthrough. Yeah. Normally, uh, we, I haven't done a Zoom call before, so uh, normally at some point we open it up for everybody to ask questions um, from across the group. So I'm not sure if we're doing that through the chat or I should invite that. Um, Mariah has asked if you guys could talk a little bit about the term evaluator and its possible limitations in terms of how people see the nature of the work that is or could be done. And do we need a broader term to describe the nature of the work? Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's partly, um, a matter of what words work in in what context um, we're putting together a program for United Nations um, uh, senior leadership on evaluation as a leadership function and trying to to move evaluative thinking and uh, um, evaluative principles from the technical side of evaluators doing it to much more the the leadership um, side, where Francis has lived and worked for so long, um, that the the work of figuring out uh, what's going on and how do we adapt to what's going on and how do we know what's going on um, is is a leadership function. It's not a technical function. The, the evaluators aren't the users of this stuff. Um, and so I I just had a wonderful experience with a a new philanthropic foundation. Um, and a, a very um, uh, innovative new CEO who was hired there um, and wanted to be sure they were doing evaluation from the beginning. And I met with his senior staff for two days and we went through the principles and uh, very excited. And, and um, he, he said to me as a closing piece, so, um, so I'm the CEO, what's, what's, what should I be doing going forward? Um, what role do I play? And I said to him in a, in a strange moment of inspiration, this was over dinner, I said, well, since you want to be innovative, how would you like to be the first CEO in the world, the chief executive and evaluation officer? You take on evaluation as part of your executive responsibilities. In the same way that being a CEO doesn't mean that you're executing everything, being the chief evaluation officer doesn't mean you're doing evaluations. It means you're being sure that evaluation is a part of the culture. And so he has actually taken on and is, is suggesting to his board that he change his title to CEO, um, chief executive and evaluation officer, to position that kind of thinking as a major executive responsibility and to be sure that they treat it in that way not as an afterthought. So I, 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 I suppose that means trying to reposition the nature of evaluation without giving up on the word. There are places where the baggage is too great and you just give up on the word, call it something else. Um, but the, uh, the opportunity to reposition it in complexity um, is part of what this book is about. We have um, lots of questions on the chat box. I have one Maybe final question. Um, I have two, but I'm going to pare it down to one. Um, in chapter, in, in section five of the book, you talk about marrying theory to practice. 
and I think if Plexus has any space in the world at all that matters, it's in that space. It's in the, the junction between theory and practice. And I was struck by the third leg of your stool. So you say, well, there's, you've got to have good theory and there's nothing so theoretically interesting as good practice. Amen. And you go on to say, there's nothing so theoretical as a good method. Can you talk a little bit about the progression from theory to practice to method and back again? Well, that's a, it's a great question. I appreciate your, your picking up on it because um, method is really the how um, of, of what you do. And so the theory is why and the practice is what you do um, and the method is how. You, you link those two together. So, so it's being methodological, it's being systematic, it's, it's, it's knowing what you're doing and paying attention to it and, and putting it, it out there. It's that, um, it's that larger enlightenment view of method, of how we go about doing what we're doing. It's triple loop learning. Um, and, and so it's, it's reflective practice. It's all of those things that is raising the question of, of how we connect theory and, and practice, how we do the work, how we gather the data, how we uh, articulate principles. Uh, I very much agree with, with Francis that one of the reasons I, I formulated the guide framework is that, that I actually found nothing anywhere in the literature that says what a principle is. I found scores, you'd be amazed, scores of books and articles that have principles in the title that have no principles in the book or in the article. It turns out that principle is a word that publishers and authors like. It sort of means I have important things I think you ought to pay attention to. I'm going to use the word principle in the title of my book and hoping you'll think that gives it gravitas, but there's not a principle in sight. Um, and a, a lot of badly worded and all kinds of strange things that pass for principles. So a part of this is bringing some rigor to the very notion of what principles are um, by looking at them through that lens of, of theory, practice, and, and method. Um, to give them some grounding and make them meaningful so people can see if they're adhering to them and, and understand where it takes them. So there's a lot of upfront work. I'm reminded that when evaluation began in the 70s, uh, we thought it was gonna just be a back-end activity, finding out whether or not people attain their goals. And we found out people didn't have goals, didn't know how to write them, and didn't know what they were. So we got in the goal writing business. And now, if we do principles-focused evaluation, as Francis suggested, either we or others are going to have to get in the principles writing business because there's not much rigor involved in it now. But that's one of the steps is helping people articulate them. Um, and that sets the stage then for looking at what they mean and what they, where they take you. Great. Really helpful. I, I'm going to exercise a little. Um, um, I have a final question. How's that? Um, <laughs> Do you think we're moving towards a theory of unified evaluation, a unified evaluation theory? I'm struck by how much. Well, I, actually, I actually think that that we that, that we have it. I mean, the the Nobel Prize in like 2012 was given to a couple of economists for what was called matching theory, and and matching theory is basically a contingency theory. It's that that you, the real trick is figuring out how do you get the right thing attached to the, the right other thing? How do, how do you match patients and, and doctors and, and, and students and teachers and, and um, um, match consumer goods with consumers? Um, and uh, essentially, how do you match the, all these different kinds of evaluation and different approaches and different needs to the kind of evaluation that is appropriate? That's part of the beauty of the simple, complicated, complex framing that Francis and I used with, with Brenda. Uh, it gives you some, some ways of thinking about what's the situation and what's appropriate to the situation. So the grand theory is not that there's a particular way to do evaluation. It's the match that you have to, to understand the situation you're in and match the evaluation and inquiry processes to that situation. Uh, simple logic models and smart goals are perfectly appropriate in simple space. They just are useless in complex space. Um, and so the grand theory is matching theory. Yeah. 
That's really helpful. We have um, several other questions on the group chat. I think we're going to uh, close our conversation down uh, just a minute early so that we don't lose folks um, in the Plexus community. First of all, let me say thank you. This has been fabulous. This has been provocative. Uh, Michael, as always, you stop me in my tracks more often than I'd like to admit, trundling along certain of things and then realize that I don't actually know very much. So it's a really helpful, thank you. Um, Francis, thank you for getting up early when I'm sure you had other things you could be doing. And Mariah from, from the banks of the Potomac, I can see you and thank you for the work that you guys are doing. This call was recorded, it will be posted um, and the questions will also be posted, I think. That's correct? Yes, we can save the chat. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to close for the community with a bit, with some sad news. Um, our good friend and colleague, Lisa Kimball, died this morning. And for those of you who haven't gotten a call, we've been making calls all morning out through the network so that people got the news. Um, there will be a page or a link on the Plexus website. I don't know quite what form that's going to take, but it will be up soon and you can watch the Plexus website 2.0 for that. And there will also be news about a memorial service. Um, John Cooney, Lisa's husband, uh, said he hadn't even begun thinking about it yet this morning. So stay tuned. Um, we talked about whether to cancel this call and the thinking among all of us was that Lisa would be furious, that she was completely in both feet for the conversation and that with her indomitable spirit would certainly have wanted us to continue the good conversations that she has seeded with so many of us. So I'm sorry to have to share that. And uh, thank you all for this wonderful conversation today. And if I can just add that the greatest tribute I think you could give Lisa, the one she would appreciate most is, you know, in some way get back involved. We're really working to reinvigorate Plexus uh, and, uh, really hoping that some of you might answer some of the, the messages that uh, Denise is sending out uh, or get involved in just a piece of helping to reinvigorate that because you know that was really her thing that she wanted Plexus to really grow again and, and blossom and, and you can all be part of that happening. And so, you know, when you get a, a message from Plexus Institute, you know, if you take the time to read it, figure out if there's a, a place for you in its sort of new revitalization, uh, I think that would be a wonderful gift to Lisa. Thank you. And, and I think I, that, good, Denise, oh, I'll turn it no. to you. And I will then let Sharon, but just gratitude to all of you. Um, gratitude to Lisa, but gratitude to all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you all very much. This has been wonderful. Thank you.